Hello and welcome everyone. We've taken an extra minute to let more participants join us. But I think we are, we have a good number now, so we'll go ahead and start. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Robin Stafford and I am with the Office of Engagement. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Jim Tucker, the Bonner Lowry Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. He is director of UVA's Division of Perceptual Studies, where he is continuing the work of Ian Stevenson with children who report memories of previous lives. He is the author of the books Life Before Life and Return to Life, which have been translated into 20 languages. Dr. Tucker's work was also recently featured in the Netflix original docu-series, Surviving Death, episode six in particular, which explores personal stories and research on near-death experiences, reincarnation, and other related phenomena. We will start today's program with Dr. Tucker's presentation to be followed by live Q&A. And I'll let you go ahead and start, Jim. All right, thanks very much, Robin. And let me share my PowerPoint slides. All right, and um, thanks everyone for tuning in uh, for this talk, which is, let me minimize that, um, which is going to be looking at uh, 60 years now of research here at UVA. Um, look at these young children from pretty much all over the world who say that they remember a past life. So uh, what I'll do is review the history of the work a little bit, and then also talk about sort of our current focuses um, uh, in particular. And it's all taking place in, uh, as Robin mentioned, the Division of Perceptual Studies, uh, where we do scientific study of extraordinary experiences. And we uh, cover a variety of, of experiences. So uh, I'm a child psychiatrist and, and I focus on, on children's um, memories of, of a past life. Um, but we have other work going on also, uh, such as near-death experiences. Um, Bruce Grayson, who is one of the world's leading experts on near-death experiences, uh, is here with us. Um, and we also have a, a neuroimaging lab where we can uh, look at um, what's going on in the brain while people are trying to do uh, psychic tasks, psychic tests and that kind of thing. And then we're also looking at uh, altered states of consciousness. So we, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, things going on in, in a variety of areas. Um, the division started and this work with children uh, all started with Ian Stevenson, as, as Robin mentioned. Um, Ian came to UVA to be uh, chair of the Department of Psychiatry uh, way back in 1957. Uh, in the midst of, of quite a successful mainstream career, he, he had written um, dozens of papers and, and was still in his 30s when he came here to be chair. Um, but then after he'd been here a little bit, he became intrigued by this phenomenon of uh, these reports of, of children who said they remember a past life. Um, so after a while, he decided to go investigate. Um, he learned about five cases in India. And then he went there for a month and found 25 cases. And he got similar results in Sri Lanka. And he realized that this phenomenon uh, was way more common than anyone, at least in the West, had any idea about and uh, became more and more intrigued by the work and, and uh, invested more time in it and eventually stepped down as chair of the department uh, in 1967 and, and started this division of perceptual studies. So uh, we celebrated our uh, 50th anniversary uh, a few years ago and, and we're still going strong. And um, Ian himself then spent the bulk of the next 35 years uh, focus on these cases. Um, he took trips all over the world. They, they were uh, most often to Asia, but plenty of other places too. Uh, this is Ian in Burma uh, as, as he's interviewing folks and, and studying a case. Um, he always took a very careful, methodical approach 
Uh, and this earned him respect in, in mainstream quarters. So his, um, he started publishing a lot of papers and also books on these. And, and one of the books uh, was interviewed, I mean, was uh, reviewed uh, in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, by the book review editor himself, actually, uh, who wrote, in regard to reincarnation, he has painstakingly and unemotionally collected a detailed series of cases from India, cases in which the evidence is difficult to explain on any other grounds. He has placed on record a large amount of data that cannot be ignored. So the work's been going on uh, since the early 60s, and we've now studied over 2,500 cases from around the world. Uh, we and a few colleagues in, in other places uh, have studied that many. Um, they are easiest to find in cultures with the belief in reincarnation. Uh, so I've listed the countries where we have the most cases, um, but that's just because we've had people looking for them there. And in fact, they've been found wherever anyone has looked. Uh, they've been found on all the continents except Antarctica. Uh, and they are certainly found here as well. And, and I'll be talking a little bit um, uh, more about the American cases in a bit. So as far as what these cases involve, um, <clears throat> it's typically young children who spontaneously start talking about a past life. Uh, these cases do not involve hypnotic regression, uh, but rather the kids just spontaneously start coming out with these things. And they typically describe a recent ordinary life. Uh, they're not talking about being kings or queens or Cleopatra or whatever. They almost never talk about being uh, a famous person. Uh, but instead, somebody who typically lived a fairly nondescript life, uh, usually fairly close by, uh, typically in the same country. Um, and when I say a recent life, uh, the average interval between the death of the previous person and the birth of the child is only four and a half years. Uh, now we have exceptions that are, could be 50 years, but for the most part, it, it tends to be quite a recent life. Uh, some of them describe being a deceased family member, uh, like a grandparent or sometimes a, a deceased sibling. Um, but others describe being strangers in other locations. And if they give enough details, like the name of the location, then people have often gone there and found that in fact, somebody did live and die whose life uh, matches the statements that the child made. Uh, and some of these can be extremely impressive. The, the match between what the child says, the details of what the child says uh, with this past life. And, um, Robin mentioned that the Netflix episode, uh, it, it covers um, some of our cases, including the two best known American cases. Uh, one little boy who remembered the uh, life of a Hollywood extra uh, and another one who recalled the um, life of a pilot who was killed in World War II. And, and um, I won't give you any more spoilers. Uh, if you haven't seen the episode, um, I'd encourage you to watch it, but it, so I won't be reviewing those cases uh, here since they do such a nice job uh, showing them and interviewing them uh, on the Netflix thing. Uh, the one part of the past life that's often out of the ordinary is how the previous person died. So in 70% of the cases, the previous person uh, died an unnatural death, meaning murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing. Uh, so that certainly seems to be an important uh, part of this phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> and these cases can provide sort of three areas, uh, general areas of evidence of a connection between the child and the previous person. Um, the uh, first of these involves birthmarks and birth defects that some of these kids have that match wounds usually the fatal wounds on the body of the previous person. Um, and Ian was fascinated by these cases. He, he had a longstanding interest in psychosomatic medicine. So the connection between mind and body uh, before he even got involved in this work. Uh, so he spent years studying these kinds of cases, the ones with birthmarks and birth defects and, and then years more writing them up. Uh, eventually, 
he published a two volume set called Reincarnation in Biology that has 200 of these cases. Um, it's 2000 pages long. Um, and, and to show you just a couple of, of the cases, there was a uh, little girl who remembered the life of a man who got his fingers chopped off as he was being murdered. And the little girl was born uh, with her hands looking like that. Uh, There's a boy who remembered the life of a boy in another village who had lost the fingers uh, of his right hand in a fodder chopping machine. Uh, and the second little boy was born with his hands looking like that. And then there was a boy who remembered the life of a man who uh, had been killed by a shotgun blast to the side of his head. And the little boy was born uh, just with a stub for an ear uh, and an underdeveloped right side of his face. Um, Ian also listed 18 cases where uh, the child was born with two birthmarks, ones that matched both the entrance wound and the exit wound uh, on the body of the previous person. Now, along with the birthmarks, of course, are the statements uh, that the children make about um, the past life. And <clears throat> I said that it was young children. Uh, the average age when a child starts talking about a past life is 35 months. So it's usually a two or three year old um, who starts coming out with these things. And, um, um, some of them do it in sort of a detached way, uh, but many of them um, show um, um, great intensity as they talk about these things and, and strong emotional involvement with this material. Uh, but even so, some of them will talk about these things with great emotion one minute and then just sort of run off and play the next. And some of them have access to the material at all times, uh, but for others, they have to be in the right frame of mind. And, and it's usually during a relaxed time, like after a warm bath or during a long car ride uh, that they just start coming out with these things. And then typically by the time they're six or seven, uh, they stop talking about it and then just go on with their lives. Um, and it, it seems that most of them lose the memory. Some still retain at least some, um, but they do stop talking about them typically and, and, and get more involved with this life and going to school and, and everything else. Now, when they are talking about the past life, um, uh, they um, typically uh, don't come out you know, really with uh, enlightened words of wisdom. And, and instead, what they do is focus on the end of the past life. So three quarters of them will talk about how the previous person died. And they're also more likely to talk about people or things that happened uh, near the end of the life. So it's as if their memories have just picked up where they left off uh, at the end of the last life. And then about 20% of them will describe events that they say happened between lives, uh, things they experienced after they died in the last life, uh, but before they were born into this one. Um, and the kids give uh, different um, memories of that time. Uh, some of them essentially describe a near death experience where they, uh, after the previous person died, they floated above the body and uh, then they uh, have encountered other beings and that sort of thing. Um, others say that they stayed near uh, either the body of the previous person or where the, um, or, or the previous person's family. Um, sometimes given verifiable details. So there was one little girl in Thailand who made a lot of statements, but one thing she said was she complained that her ashes were scattered rather than buried uh, the way she'd wanted them to be. Well, the previous woman's daughter um, went to bury them under the bow tree at the temple complex, which uh, where the woman studied because that's what the woman had requested, but the root system of the tree was too extensive where she couldn't bury them, so she, uh, she scattered them instead. And then some of the kids will talk about uh, either choosing their next parents or being guided to their next parents, sometimes observing their parents, and then starting on uh, with this life. Um, Along with the statements and, and the birthmarks and the birth defects, 
can be behaviors that seem connected to the past life. Uh, so I've mentioned the emotions that, that many of these kids will show. Um, in the case of violent deaths, 35% um, of the kids will show phobias and an intense fear toward that mode of death. Uh, so there's one little girl where from the time she was born, basically, she hated being in water. And it would take three adults to hold her down to give her a bath when she was an infant. And then when she got old enough to talk, describes the life of a girl in another village who had drowned in an accident. Um, likes and dislikes that this uh, picture of a child smoking a cigarette is not actually from one of our cases, but it, it could be. Because unfortunately, it seems that addictive substances can sometimes continue their allure uh, even across lifetimes. So if the previous person was a heavy smoker or a heavy drinker, uh, then these little kids sometimes will try to be um, uh, sneaking cigarettes or, or even sneaking liquor um, uh, as if their addiction has just kind of continued on. Um, and then themes in play, some of these kids will play compulsively at themes that seem connected most often the occupation of the previous person. Uh, so there was one, one little boy who played at being a biscuit shopkeeper for hours on end, refused to do anything else, uh, including his schoolwork, and fell behind. And, and his mom felt like he, he really never quite caught up. Um, but there was just such a compulsive uh, need on his part, it seemed, to, to act out uh, being a shopkeeper again. Um, so um, <clears throat> when we talk about the uh, sort of current areas of our focus. Uh, one of them would be a database. So uh, with all of our cases, we code them on 200 variables and then put them into database. And, and it's taking us many, many years to get all the old cases coded. Uh, but we do have uh, over 2,200 of them now in our database. So we, we can look at features or trends in the cases that uh, you can't really see um, uh, on an individual case level. Um, so one thing that we looked at is the mode of death, which you know, I mentioned earlier seems important. Um, I'm, I'll warn you, I'm getting ready to show you a graph that looks complicated, but it's not quite as bad as it looks, I hope. Um, going up and down is the number of cases, and then going across is the age when the previous person died. The green bars on top are all the natural death cases, and all the other colors are the various kinds of unnatural death cases. The main point of the slide is to show you that we have a lot of unnatural death cases. Um, but it also looks like the previous people often died young. Uh, the complicating factor is that people who die unnatural deaths tend to be younger. But what we can do with the database, we can pull out the unnatural death ones, look at just the natural death to see if dying young is an independent factor uh, from dying a violent death. Uh, this next graph is just one I pulled off the internet, but it's a typical graph of deaths by uh, age when the person died, getting up and going up and down as number of cases uh, across as the age when they died. And, and you see this gradually upsloping curve until finally, uh, there's so few people left that it drops off. But for the most part of the lifespan, just this gradually upsloping curve. Well, in our cases, in our uh, natural death cases, what we see is that the curve goes in the other direction. And in fact, a quarter of the cases, that the previous person uh, was age 15 or less. So there seems to be something about violent, dying violently or dying young that makes it more likely uh, that a child will later have uh, memories of that life. Um, another factor that we've looked at with our database is uh, looking at gender in these cases. So we've known for quite some time that, more, uh, that boys are more likely to talk about a past life than girls. And we've wondered why that is. 62% of our cases involve a boy talking about a past life. Um, one way of looking at this question is 
uh, why do more of the past lives involve males and females? So 90% of the children talk about a past life as a member of the same sex. Um, and in fact, it's also 62% of our cases where the previous person was male. Um, and I think we have a good idea now why that is. So <clears throat> in the natural death cases, it's actually 50-50. Uh, it's in the unnatural death cases where we have uh, more male past lives and it's 73% of our unnatural death cases in, involve a boy or a man. Well, we get the same trends in, in the general population uh, because men engage in more high-risk behaviors than women do. Uh, so I got five years of data from the CDC and it showed that 72% of unnatural death cases uh, involve males compared to 73% in our sample. Um, so the sex breakdown by, by the mode of death uh, for our collection of cases matches exactly what you would expect uh, if they are in fact a, a sample of lies from the past. Now, another uh, area of focus of ours these days is American cases. Um, Ian focused on Asia because that's where he could find the cases. They're easier to find in, in uh, places with a belief in reincarnation. But here now, we don't have to find American cases because they find us. Uh, with the advent of the internet, um, if a child's talking about a past life, the parent can Google and, and pretty quickly find us and, and contact us. So uh, we heard from a Amer uh, hundred uh, American families last year, and we're already well over that this year. Um, so what we are discovering is that they are more common here, or certainly seem to be more common here than, uh, than anybody has known. Um, it's just that the families often don't tell anyone uh, so that the word doesn't spread very much. Um, but the ones that they contact us about uh, typically come from families who had no belief in, in past lives before their a child started talking about one. Um, but what we see is that the American cases have the same features as the cases in other countries. So it's a young child who starts talking about a past life, often talking about how they died. Um, some of them have had birthmarks and birth defects. They, they show the same kinds of behaviors. Uh, so the American cases are proof that that children's reports of, of past life memories, that they aren't purely a cultural phenomenon, uh, which is what some people thought with Ian's work earlier. Uh, but in fact, uh, they're happening here where there is no general cultural belief in reincarnation uh, and happening in families without a belief in reincarnation. Um, hearing from more American families means that we are also hearing from more where the child is still young. And with some of these now, lately, we've been able to, do, to test the children a little bit and test them to see if they can recognize people or places from the past life. Uh, so what I've done several times lately is, uh, now these are very young children. Um, they've, I think, all been five when I've done the test. But what I have shown them are pairs of pictures where one of the picture is from the identified past life. The other one is a control picture uh, to see if the child can pick out the correct one from that pair. Um, and uh, let me tell you about one of these cases where I, I did some recognition tests. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, a little boy who, a uh, little boy named Grant, who asked if his parents remembered when he was in the war. And he said how he was in the army and, and described uh, the jungle and beach. And, and he said it was 1969. Uh, so his parents asked him if he was talking about Vietnam and, and he said that, uh, yes, he was. And, and gave details talking about uh, the trenches and, and gun and so forth. And, and said that he died in an explosion uh, when he was 21 years old. And he also gave a last name and it was a name that, um, uh, well, it's not a common name, it's an uncommon name, and um, the state where he was from. So his mom then uh, did an online search and found the um, uh, Vietnam Memorial website. And she was shocked to see 
that a man with that name from that state had been killed in Vietnam when he was 21. Um, so she told me she didn't research that man anymore, but she did research the idea of past lives and, and found us and wrote to me. Um, so I did do some research. I joined a newspaper archive site where I could get access, for instance, to the man's obituary, and then I followed leads from that. And anyway, I, I eventually went out and met with Grant and his parents, and I brought with me uh, some pictures to, to show Grant to see if he could pick out the right ones. So um, I was able to find out where the, mon uh, where the man had gone to high school. So I showed Grant uh, two pictures of a, uh, these are both Central High School. And um, he correctly said that he had uh, been to the one on the right. Um, I also, I was able to find out, uh, find the house where the man had grown up. Uh, and I showed Grant a pair of pictures, um, one with the house, one with the control. He didn't make a selection on that one. And of course, I don't know how the house's appearance might have changed in 50 years. Uh, but then I showed him the house across the street, along with a control picture. And, and he correctly uh, said that he remembered the one on the left. And then uh, after that visit, I came back here continued to do more researching. And, and by belonging to uh, classmates.com, I was actually able to access the man's high school yearbook from the year he graduated from high school, 1968. Uh, so I sent Grant's mom by email, I sent her attachments of um, pages from that yearbook. Uh, and I sent uh, pages showing the administration and the uh, pictures of students and pictures of teachers, um, and uh, Grant was right on all of them. And when I emailed his mom back and told her that, she, she wrote back and said, oh, wow, that is absolutely crazy. He was so casual about it. Um, and then I wrote to the man's um, um, sister, uh, and her daughter, the man's niece, uh, wrote back and sent some family photos. So I showed, I didn't have a great picture of the man's mom, but I showed Grant what I had with the control and, and he didn't make a selection for that one. Uh, but I also showed pictures of, of uh, father. Uh, he correctly, I remember the one on the right. Um, and then said that he was tired of looking at pictures. But uh, all together, I showed him eight pairs of pictures. Uh, he didn't make a selection on a couple of them, uh, but for the others, he was six out of six. And you know, it's like flipping a coin, having it come up heads six times in a row. The, the odds of that by doing it by chance would be one out of 64. Uh, so when we can do tests like that, it, it certainly contributes to uh, the evidence uh, that there is this connection between the child uh, and the past life. So what do we make of, of all this work that, that's been going on here that, UVA for, for 60 years now. Well, <clears throat> I think I'm not being too bold uh, to say that we now have good evidence that some young children have memories uh, of a life from the past. And the most straightforward explanation for that is that they have the memories because they experienced that life. Um, but that would mean, I think, that uh, there was this consciousness piece that continued on after the previous person died, um, which would suggest, I think, that all of us uh, may have this consciousness piece that um, is independent of our physical being. Well, how do we make sense of that? I mean, I, I don't think we can, if we accept these cases, I don't think we can map them on to um, the sort of uh, paradigm of scientific materialism, the idea that physical matter is all there is. Um, um, that doesn't match with, with these cases. But that paradigm of scientific materialism has actually been under threat for a hundred years now. With, with the advent of quantum mechanics or, or quantum physics, um, it has really challenged that, and, and I'm certainly not going to uh, give a lecture on quantum physics, but, but it, one of the basics 
of quantum physics is the importance of the observer on the so-called observer effect. And, and it appears that an observer is necessary for quantum events to occur. Uh, quantum events meaning uh, uh, the universe at the, at the smallest level, the smallest particles. Um, and at that most basic level, um, there needs to be an observer for things to happen. And, and um, uh, one physicist called this the participatory universe, how, how observers participate in, in making uh, the universe occur, um, which really indicates that an observer, the uh, observers are really at, at the core of reality. Uh, so as, as quantum physics was being developed, um, physicists were kind of amazed by that. And, and uh, there's one, a physicist and, a, and an astronomer, uh, Sir James Jeans, who said, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. Mind no longer appears as an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. Uh, we are beginning to suspect that we ought rather to hail it as a creator and governor of the realm of matter. And um, Max Planck, who is the father of quantum physics uh, said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Well, our cases are consistent with that. Um, it's, it's the consciousness that has continued even though the brain, the physical matter has ended. And uh, this would suggest that the brain has served as a, a vehicle for consciousness, uh, but not the producer of it. And uh, again, it's the consciousness that is fundamental. Um, so take home message, I would, would argue that uh, each of us may have this consciousness piece that is fundamental to our existence. Uh, and as our cases suggest, uh, can continue on um, after we die. Uh, if you want to learn more about our work, uh, here's our website. Uh, we are also on Facebook and YouTube. And um, I will stop my screen share and, and uh, turn it over for Q&A. Great. Thanks so much, Jim. So interesting. Um, I'm curious about whether, um, do you ever, do you stay in touch with these children? Is there any effort to connect them with the families of the people they say they, um, whose lives they had? I'm curious about that. Uh, we do stay connected with some of them. And in fact, now we're doing a study of interviewing adults who we originally studied when they were children. And I say we, it could have been Ian Stevenson on up. Um, and we're, we're sort of still crunching the numbers, but um, um, even though it's very difficult for many of the kids to go through the time and their parents, uh, most of them look back as it being a positive part of their development. And some of them talk about how it gave them a more spiritual outlook on life, you know, which was a positive for them. Uh, as far as the families meeting, uh, we have done that. Um, um, and when it happens, I mean, you might think it would stir up the memories more, but often what it does is it seems to kind of lessen the intensity of it. And, and I think that's because when the child sees the previous place or sees the previous family, first of all, it confirms their memories that they're not crazy or making it up, that people should believe them. Uh, but it also points out to them that the past is in the past and, and that the families have gone on with, with their lives and, and the child has a different life. And that often makes it easier for them to kind of let go of the memories. Hmm. Um, let's see. Okay. Some questions did come in with the registrations. I'll start with a couple of those. This first question is a multi-part uh, question, but do you believe that everyone experiences reincarnation or only some people? Um, interesting question. And um, I, I can't say that our cases really answer that question. I mean, the, the fact that, again, if you accept the cases, uh, that there are these children born with memories, it doesn't tell us that we all have past lives, but the memories just don't come through. 
Or is it that we may all have this consciousness con that continues, but not necessarily comes back here? And my own personal belief is, and, and I'm just speculating, I don't see any reason why we would all be tied to this existence. Uh, I, I think we could all we could have all kinds of types of experiences or existences uh, that would not be limited to just this physical world. Okay, and we did have a couple um, around animals. Do you believe that humans mm. can be reincarnated as animals? Um, or vice versa, animals as humans, which is probably easier to study. We, uh, we get very few of those reports, but uh, not zero. Uh, we, we have had some, um, you know, they're pretty unverifiable, but if a child may say they remember being all kinds of animals, uh, a snake is one, um, an ox and different things. Um, whether we can then be reborn as, as an animal, Maybe uh, we, you know, animals are not reporting that to us, um, but it's, you know, who knows? I, I, I wouldn't be thrilled at the idea of coming back as an animal. I mean, I wouldn't mind too much having been one in the past, but I wouldn't look forward to it too much. But, but there are people who like the idea of coming back as, you know, an eagle or, or whatever. So we don't know. And the last part of this question, um, where do you, do you have any thoughts on where souls go until they are reincarnated? Um, well, not really. I mean, I, I think, uh, again, the kids give different descriptions about where they went. Uh, again, some being tightly connected with this realm, uh, but then others going to uh, place other realms like, um, I think I said some of the American kids will say heaven uh, or, or go to kind of other places. My, my guess would be that they wouldn't get too far afield because then they come back here. And, and then again, I, I think our cases, they don't, the patterns we see are not necessarily universal. These are ones where intact memories came through um, and they seem to have been you know, fairly close to, to this world uh, and then come back for another life. Let's see, um, how does your knowledge of past and future lives impact how you live your current life? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, people, um, different things speak to them. And for me, uh, this whole area, and that not just my cases, but, but the other cases, uh, the other areas, uh, to me, strengthen my belief that we are more than just our physical bodies. And that there is this consciousness that I think is sort of a larger part of ourselves. Um, so I, I think it, I hope it makes me see that we all share this kind of um, larger self separate from our physical day-to-day -day battles or struggles or whatever. Uh, so I, I hope in some small way it, it helps me to treat others better and, and sort of to see the um, commonality that we share rather than focusing on the differences. Great, and then the last one from the uh, registration, this is from Ann Newgarden, um, who knows you. Big hello to you. Um, she is uh, just about to self-publish a book that you're featured in, and she wants to thank you. Um, she's wondering whether you get much pushback from the science community, both at the university and at large. Um, and if so, um, you know, have people become more open to the idea of reincarnation once they have taken a look at your research? Yeah, well, that's interesting. As far as pushback, um, I'm sure that there are many people here at UVA uh, who, when they learn about our work, think it's a complete waste of time. Uh, but also, you, you never know who's open to it. And, and the, I mean, I don't typically get pushback in the sense of, you know, someone in another department writing me and saying, you're an idiot. Um, now, they may say that behind my back. But, um, but what I do get is, hearing from people at UVA or in other universities who are writing uh, because they're so intrigued by the work. And, and um, I recently did a grand rounds uh, at, in pediatrics department here. And then afterwards, a couple of the faculty members 
emailed me immediately after the, my talk uh, because they had had experiences with patients that uh, were connected really more with near-death experiences than, than with past life memories. But, um, you know, these, these unusual experiences, and it was hard for them to talk about with their colleagues sometimes um, because of a concern that, that other people would look down on them. But I, I think there's, there are more experiences than we know and, and also more people in medicine and, and science than we know who, who are actually open to this kind of phenomenon. I will go now to some of the Q&A questions yeah. that have come in. Um, and one reference is Brian Weist, and, or Weiss, I'm Weiss, wondering, yeah. Weiss. Um, so I'm wondering um, this one question, as all, adults, is it possible to intentionally access those memories of previous lives like Dr. Brian Weiss claims to achieve with his patients? Yeah, so uh, Brian Weiss is a Yale trained psychiatrist uh, in Florida who um, sort of discovered, uh, fell into doing hypnotic regression, taking adults back to their past lives. And I mean, he's written some interesting books. His first one was about this undeniably an interesting case. Um, but we're very skeptical of hypnotic regression uh, because hypnosis, even for memories of this life, can be a very unreliable tool, I meaning sometimes it's amazing. So people will call, let's say, license plate numbers from crime scenes or whatever. Uh, but a lot of times the mind just fills into blanks. And that then makes it very hard to tell afterwards the person doesn't know was that an actual memory or is that something that my mind created so if you then take that process and put it into past life memories often of which are completely unverifiable because people will recall lives in ancient times and that sort of thing um, there's not a lot of reason to think that the people are actually recalling a past life uh, with very rare exception i mean there have been cases where the people came up with information that was quite obscure and, and it seemed unlikely uh, that they had um, learned about it through some sort of ordinary means. Uh, but those are very much the exception to the rules. So uh, we were, uh, I mean, Dr. Weiss, I'm, I'm sure is a, is a very solid person, but, but we're not convinced that uh, his patients, they may get, their symptoms may get better. They may get cured from phobias or whatever, but we're not convinced that they're actually recalling the past life most of the time. Okay. Um, a couple of people wondered if you could just differentiate between natural and unnatural death. Uh, right. So, um, I mean, as far as definition goes, so a, a natural death is, for, you know, from natural causes. Uh, so any kind of illness or, or old age or whatever, whereas the unnatural is anything else. So again, murder, accident, suicide, combat. And again, um, 70% uh, of our cases involve unnatural death, which is way more than in the general population of, of anywhere. Um, so it seems that for, un, uh, for um, intact memories to come through, that it often involves traumatic memories. And you know, it may, it's almost like PTSD, where people, for they've been through traumatic things in this life. They wish that they could put the memories away, but they keep being there. And, and it seems the same with this, that the, the kids have these traumatic memories. Uh, and with those memories can often come other details of, of the life, uh, but it may well be the traumatic memories that are kind of carrying it all forward. Um, have you ha had any of the children report um, more than one life in the past? Uh, yes, not very often, but some do. And, and typically they describe one in a lot of detail and then another one just um, a very sort of scant kind of uh, description. Uh, but, but most of the memories will focus on one. Okay, let's see. Um, any thought about why um, the memories these children express um, are not retained later in life? Yeah, the... the you know, as, as children develop, uh, especially around the age of five or six, is, so the, the brain is undergoing tremendous change. And that's when they lose, when all children lose memories of early childhood. Uh, so if, if there's, say, a, 
a close family friend when the child is two or three, that family friend is clearly in their long-term memory. They may call them by name and so forth. But if that friend moves away, by the time the child is, is five or six, usually they've forgotten all about them. Uh, so it kind of makes sense that the children would lose the memories of the past life along with their uh, memories of early childhood. And of course, there are exceptions to both. I mean, there are some people who say they remember, you know, getting their diaper changes as, as a toddler, um, but not very many. And, and there are some who, uh, of our cases, who say they still retain at least some memories from the past life. Let's see. Um, is there any indication of a connection between the current life's family or relatives and the past life family and relatives? Connection, I wonder what that means, if it means it's the same person come back. Uh, if that's the question, um, almost never. If it means, did the families know each other beforehand? Um, there are cases, there, there are plenty of cases where that's true. And you know that always lessens the, the um, level of evidence because we don't know if, if the parents knew about the previous person, then could the child have learned about the previous person through some sort of ordinary means? Uh, but then we have all these cases where there was no connection at all between the two families and they could be spread apart by hundreds of miles and yet the children have the memories. Mm. Uh, let's see, um, this person is referencing a medical center hour uh, that Ian Stevenson participated in. Mm. Let's see, many years ago, Ian Stevenson talked about a small sample of cases where the person in the previous life died after the child with the memories of the past life was born. And what would you say about this? Right, um, those are what Ian called anomalous dates cases. And there are not a lot of them. Um, and typically it'll be where the child will get very sick and near death. And then when they recover, they have these memories from uh, the life of someone who died after the child was born. Um, so it's kind of as if the past soul or consciousness or whatever had an opportunity to kick out the, the one that had been there and, and kind of took its place. Um, you know, those cases, to be honest, can be a little uncomfortable to think about too much, but, but they are there. And uh, again, it's not routine, but, but, but we do have those cases. Let's see, somebody's wondering whether you've looked at deja vu at all. Hmm. Um, and what you think about that, does it relate to past lives? Yeah, I, I think it depends to some extent on, on what we mean by deja vu. I mean, a lot of people mean it where you, you think you've had this conversation before or whatever, and, and it's, it may well be a sort of a neurological thing. Now, literally deja vu, meaning having seen before, I mean, there are people who will see, go somewhere they've never been before and um, say that they remember it before. And, and we'll occasionally be able to say, oh, well, around that corner is such and such. Um, you know, when that happens, you sure have to wonder, uh, could, it, could it be a, a connect with a past life? Uh, but the more sort of general sense of just, I, I feel like I've done this before, um, probably not. Uh, let's see, in your opinion, what is the most promising line of research seeking to prove and explain the existence of consciousness independent of physical bodies? Well, again, it, it involves sort of a different areas of work that many of which we do here. I, mean, I think they all add to it as far as the past life memories, near death experiences. Sometimes people, you know, as they're very near death or when their heart stops. Um, have a lot of experiences, sometimes again, getting verifiable details of things that happen in another location. Uh, there has been serious work with mediums. People say that they can communicate with the dead. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of mediums who have no ability at all, and, and it's certainly an area that can be susceptible to fraud. But then there have been some controlled studies with, with mediums where, where they seem to have access to information. Uh, so, those are the kinds of things that contribute to evidence. I don't think any of them or all of them are ever going to convince sort of mainstream science to let go of the materialist paradigm. Um, but again, there's work in areas like quantum physics that as that advances, 
it may certainly allow for these kinds of, of phenomena and, and possibly could sort of require them where it, it, again, it would work toward this idea ultimately that consciousness is the core of reality and that the physical world grows out of it. So what we experience as, um, as the fundamental reality of this world uh, is actually not, that, that it's something that consciousness creates. Um, I'll probably have to wait at least until my next left, lifetime and, and maybe more than that for that to happen. But, but I do think it's possible uh, that, that one day that will be the uh, accepted paradigm. Hmm. Um, let's see, here's a question about Catholicism. Uh, hmm. Have you had any experience with cases of children of Catholic families? And if so, have the families been receptive to the experience and how is it explained to the child? Um, is related to Catholic teachings? Um, well, we certainly have plenty where the parents are Christian. To be honest, I'd have to look up. Uh, I ha we haven't specifically looked to see, we code for it, but we haven't, I haven't looked at the database to see how many Catholic families there are, but I, I'd be very surprised if there aren't any. Uh, but I, I think for, for all the Christian families, I mean, some of them are more accepting than others, but what many of them do is, they believe their child, uh, they believe that the child are called a past life, but they don't necessarily, it doesn't challenge their religious beliefs. Uh, they just sort of incorporate that as, as uh, something that happens, um, but, but still believe very much in, in a Christian God and, and Jesus and so forth. Um, and, you know, I mean, none of us know everything, right? Even if we have strong religious beliefs. And in fact, the polls have shown that 20% of American Christians actually believe in reincarnation. Uh, and it, it's often a private belief, but, but the belief is certainly there that people incorporate along with their other Christian beliefs. Hmm. Let's see, somebody's remarking um, on the story you told us um, about the four or five-year-old saying that they were 21 years old or that mm. they were in Vietnam. And she's wondering, are these kinds of mature perspective details um, common in the accounts? Yeah, I mean, many of the children talk about being a child that died. Um, but, I mean, they're ones who talk about being an old man who died. Um, and, you know, it's all told through the through the eyes of a young child. So it, it's sort of an odd mix there. Um, and certainly from what the parents say, it's very much their child describing these things. I mean, they don't, they don't see a 21 year old man or a 50 year old man sort of take over, but, but more their, their kid who, who remembers being an older person. Mm. Um, let's see, considering the violence, are there cases that can be traced back to the Holocaust? Uh, there have been those cases. And in fact, um, there was a rabbi who wrote a book on those cases. Um, I, I can't recall his name uh, at the moment, but certainly if, if people are interested, they if, if they Google Holocaust and then past life memories, I'm not sure they could find it. So yes, there, there are certainly those cases there. Let's see. Um, are there, let's see, do any of your cases show more than one soul or spirit embodied in a person? Hmm. Uh, not in any sort of explicit way. I mean, that I'd have to stop and think how that might show up. Um, I mean, there are kids who talk about, you know, like I mentioned, more than one life, but, but it's not sort of competing. On the flip side, there are a few cases where um, two children seem to have memories of the same life. And, and these are particularly common in, in um, uh, British Columbia, where there's an anthropologist who studies those cases. Now, I will say they're taking places in, in groups of people where they may identify some, a child as being uh, the reincarnation of somebody on pretty little evidence. But, but anyway, that raises the possibility that there can at least be sort of soul splitting where, where we can uh, kind of experience two simultaneous lives, um, which again is kind of interesting to think about at least. Okay, let's see. Um, 
Why do you think there are not more cross-cultural cases being reborn in another country or culture? Well, it's a good question. And it certainly is not random to be sure, um, you know, where you come back. Uh, and it, my feeling is it's all uh, to come back with intact memories. It tends to be a um, life that was close in a number of ways. So it tends to be very recent, tends to be nearby geographically. Um, and um, it, it's often the same kind of life. So they, they, um, um, they're the same kind of person, same kind of uh, um, national identity kind of thing. Uh, again, for the intact memories to come through. So it's, it's as if the consciousness or whatever we want, we want to call it doesn't drift too far away. Uh, again, for the memories to still be there. Uh, so again, they, they, it doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't plenty of people who do get reborn in, into another culture. Uh, now, it can also be tricky. I mean, we do get those reports sometimes, and they're just, they don't come with enough details where we can verify it. So, you know, we hear that a child says, uh, my last life, I was in Africa. Well, you've got to get a lot more specific than that for us to be able to verify it. And with the cases that Ian studied in, in these Asian villages, if a child talked about a life from an, in another place, um, it, was, it would be impossible basically for, for the people to be able to track it down. Okay, we have just a minute left. Um, <laughs> somebody has asked about um, the work of these psychotherapists, the Carmens in California. Um, who wrote a book, Babies Are Cosmic. Are you familiar with that? Um, I am not familiar with that, but it's certainly an intriguing title. So I'll, I'll have to look into it. Yes, it's Babies Are Cosmic, Signs of Their Secret Intelligence hmm. um, by the Carmens. Hmm. Um, let's see. Okay, terrific. Oh, have you encountered one more? This is sort of interesting. Have you encountered cases of children who demonstrate knowledge of a foreign language they've never studied or learned in this lifetime? Uh, yes, we, we don't get a lot of those reports, to be honest, um, but we have had some. And we've also had ones where the parents say that the child spoke a language that no one could understand. Uh, and then, you know, so that could be a cross-cultural one. And I mean, we do have cases like that where the child say, I don't know, in, in um, Thailand says that it previously lived in Japan and, and they say it was a different language, but we, didn't, we couldn't understand it. Um, but it's a tiny number of cases where they actually seem to be able to speak a, another language. It's not, it's not that we've never had those cases, but we have not had very many. Okay. Thank you. Well, this has been so interesting. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yes. And if you'd like to put another plug in for the, uh, the Netflix series, go ahead or your books. I know you've just recently, um, they've re released an edition of your two books in one. Um, well, that's right. Since you're asking for a plug, uh, yeah, the name of <laughs> it was before. Um, and um, the Netflix series is called Surviving Death. Uh, and I'll say the first episode is on near-death experiences and includes my colleague, Bruce Grayson. And then this last episode is the one with our cases. Terrific. Okay, thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.